um, Broken Silence um, shares the, the heartache and pain of um, being lied to, being cheated on, giving someone your all, and just being, like all that was just taken for granted, so to say. Um, in a manipulative way and I thought I, I loved him and I, I guess I'm thinking the, the thought process of, of that young mindset was that this is how love's supposed to um, be shown because this is what I was accustomed to growing up in a household of, of violence mother and father screaming and yelling furniture breaking and this was a way to show that you love them if you um, if you gave pain or whatever. So um, my situation, like I said, started at 15 years old and it soon escalated to the decade relationship that I was in with this person that, um, that I thought I loved and, and he loved me and stuff. And it was just, it was horrible. Do I look like I was born yesterday? Look at me when I'm talking to you. I hear you. Nah, you don't hear me. You see me, but you don't hear me. You know what? Fucking ass over It was horrible, needless to say. It was just horrible because as a grown woman, um, I had nightmares of this abuse of my parents and the things that I experienced in, in my relationship. And, um... I had to seek counseling. I needed I needed to to speak to someone because I didn't realize that how things transpired when I was young, how it really affected me as a grown woman, and I guess as I was a mom. So um, I started looking at things differently. When I was younger, school age girl, probably in second grade or third grade or so, um, I would be waking up by. My parents fighting, um, I keep going, but, um, Just the pain um, that I heard um, growing up from my mom and dad fighting, um, her crying and you know yelling, begging you know my dad to stop and stuff. Um, you know it was like he would be beating her like she was a male in the street, um, and those things like. Um, frightened me it made me afraid it made me afraid to the point where I became afraid of my dad um, I loved him but I guess the things that I seen that side of him you know beating and punching on my mom it was just horrible you know it was it was very horrible um, waking up in the morning some days we couldn't even go to school because my parents were um, you know, fighting throughout the night. So my mom would be badly beat up, you know, busted lips and, you know, I guess just in pain from being beat and stomped on and stuff like that. So we would miss school, I would miss school a lot. It was it was times where, you know, I had a good old happy day at school and then my mom would come home, well not come home, my, my mom would pick us up from school, me and my sisters in a police car. Like, who wants their parents to come to a school in a patrol car? So, you know, she would, you know, come and I already knew that something done happened, you know, something bad done happened, you know, that day. And and this was like normal. This was the normal way, you know, of living, you know, and um, it's just horrible. It, it was it was horrible for a kid, very traumatic, and 
as a mom now, I, I didn't realize how bad it it affected me, you know, until I became a mom and and just having, you know, dreams. I would have these bad dreams, you know, of my of my dad and stuff. And then when I was um, 15 and started experiencing things with in my own relationship, you know, he too became a bad dream. Um, and this would go on for years and, and years. And um, I was a tough person, tough, tough cookie, short, you know, five feet, four eleven, and I was tough. You know, you sock me, I'm gonna sock you back. But <laughs> um, that's just how I was, and and my mom was the same way because I, I I seen her pretty much get beat to to the ground, and you know she would get back up. But it's just frightening to to think about all the things that has happened um, with my parents. You know, um, I recall us pushing furniture to the door to try to keep my dad out, like when he finally would leave and my mom would put the locks on the door and stuff and we would be pushing the furniture. Now I'm like in first and second grade and I'm trying to push furniture to the, to the door to you know, barricade herself in to keep him from coming back in. And I remember one time my dad came through the doggone window. He kicked the dangling window out. Um, he came through the fire escape. He couldn't come through the front door, so he came through the fire escape. And it was a night, I'll never forget that, we had to sleep, you know, with the window kicked out. And I believe it was cold. I remember it being kind of cold. And I just remember me and my sisters um, bowling up in the bed with my mom, you know, after they had a bad fight. And she would be crying and, and me trying to console her and, you know... Uh, stuff like that, you know, but it was just, just really heartbreaking, you know, um, to see your parent, any parent, like, go through stuff like that, and then it was plenty of times, I mean, years, not even plenty of times, it was years where I found myself running out in the street, you know, in the bad neighborhood in the South Bronx, I'm running out in the street, on Beekman Avenue trying to pay, call, um, get to a pay phone to um, call the police and stuff, the authorities, because they was fighting and stuff like that. And I would be running out in the street, and it, it would be like 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning. I mean, it didn't even matter. But I would be running out in the street trying to get help for my mom. And um, it was times that we had to stay with our neighbors, either next door or downstairs. They would, you know, try to you know, comfort us and, you know, keep us from not being, you know, afraid and, you know, stuff like that. Um, it's just a lot of horrible memories with domestic violence, you know. The, the, this is the start of a, a um, generational um, event, I guess, so to say. But, um, so that's my memories of me being young with my mother and father fighting and uh, like cats and dogs and police being called and stuff like that very very horrible I don't think I ever became numb it just was uh, you just didn't know what day it was gonna be you know you know things could sound like it was good you go to bed everything seemed nice but then you woken up with yelling and screaming and stuff. So that was just the way of living, which was, you know, really startle you. You know, you getting woken up out of your sleep with screaming and yelling and furniture breaking and yelling and punching and all types of stuff, cries and stuff. So um, I can't say I was never numb. It was just like, I just didn't even know what to think. I just, I just was just afraid you know just just afraid and I held a lot of stuff in so that's why I used my pen and paper as an outlet to express how I felt because I didn't have many friends and I don't know I just didn't like a lot of friends I was always independent I always liked to be by myself pretty much I did my own little thing I created my own little um 
my own little circle, you know, but I did have maybe one or two friends that I thought, you know, was, that were my friends, but, um, um, I grew out of being silent, you know, and I would say how I feel, you know, I will voice how I feel and it may not come out good now, but I, you know, I say how I feel. And when it gets to a point where I feel like I need to remove myself, I will, you know, I don't ever want it to really escalate, you know, um, to get, you know, out of hand or something. I, I, I would try different things to calm myself down when I'm angry, you know, like listen to music. Sometimes I will write, you know, my thoughts and write poetry. But if I see listening to music and writing is not, you know, helping, then I have to remove myself completely out of the situation until I calm down. And, you know, then I will come back and revisit whatever. But I used to be like a ticking time bomb, I believe, because I held stuff in for so long, which was is more doing doing more damage than it did good being silent. So I was a ticking time bomb, what you know. Age, what age do you think that started? You, you um, started just letting it all out. I think the when I started arguing with my boyfriend when I was in my teenage years, uh, maybe early as fourteen, maybe. But I really know dis- distinguishedly 15 was my first physical situation. And, and it could have been 15 is when we actually started really arguing and fighting and stuff like that. Yo, Dwanda, who this nigga Bobby I heard you mess with at school? There's a little rumor going around. You messing with some mark-ass nigga named Bobby from down the street. Hey, I know you can be talking to you. Who the fuck is Bobby? Who is this nigga Bobby? I ain't gonna ask you again. A friend. A friend you was giving a don't to and need the bleaches every day? That's who your friend was? Just fuck the orange juice down. For fuck about this goddamn juice. For fuck is this nigga, huh? I ain't gonna ask you again. Look at me when I talk to you. Look at me. Do I look stupid to you? Do I look like I was born yesterday? Huh? Oh, so now you don't wanna speak? Now you ain't got nothing to say. That's all right. You gonna play the set, don't fucking don't you. You gonna listen to me when I fucking talk to you, bitch. You gonna fucking listen to me. When I ask you a question, you fucking answer. friend of mine that I had and um, he wanted to know if me and the guy had sexual relations and um, I didn't want to answer his questions because we done argued so much about this situation I didn't want to um, I didn't want to talk about it so when I chose to ignore him um, he you know he choked me until I passed out so that was our first situation with um physical. I was I was angry, I was crying, I was hysterical that I woke up choking and gasping for air. I woke up, I was on the floor and I was choking and gasping for air. I was I was I was very upset. I just wanted to just get away from him. Did you feel any remorse about it? Um I can't really remember, but I'm sure he probably did from a certain extent when he realized what he actually did. You like fucking me, don't you? You like making me mad? You like seeing the side of me, don't you? You like seeing the you like seeing the nigga out of me, don't you? You like this side. You like it, don't you? Why are you keeping me out like this? You know I love you, girl. I met him walking down the street in the South Bronx. Um, 
I was walking down Brook Avenue and um, was coming from a person's house. Um, another friend of mine, associate of mine from school, walking from, from his house. And um, he had stopped me. Um, I was walking down the street and he had, you know, stopped me. He was saying hello to me and I didn't respond. He said hello about four times and then I finally turned around and I asked him, did he know me? And, um, and his response was like, no, but I can get, I want to get to know you. And I'm like, mm, okay. And so we just started conversing from that point on. It was a time where I was living with my grandma after we was uh, not no longer living with my parents. I was living with my grandmother in her custody. And I, re I remember, recall getting upset at um, something that was going on in the house. I thought that my sister was being treated unfair and I got upset. And so I called myself leaving. And I packed my little bags and stuff, and I, and I left, and I traveled to Harlem, and um, and asked my dad, I guess, can I stay with him? I can't remember the whole situation, but I asked him, can I stay with him? And he welcomed me in, you know, without a problem, and I uh, ended up staying with him for maybe a month. I was about 16 or 15 years old, somewhere around there. I was, I can't remember exactly, but 15 or 16 years old, maybe 15. And um, my parents were broken up at the time after about 19 years of being together. They, they finally broken up. And I went and stayed with my dad. He had a girlfriend at the time who was pregnant. And um, you know, everything was fine. Until so one night, um, it was like in the month of December, he had, um, we, we stayed, they stayed in like a rear row house. Um, that's one door leads to another room and so on and so forth. So my room was the room that was next to their bedroom. It's the room that I was staying in, sleeping in, or uh, whatever. And one particular night, he, my father, I was in the bed, I was sleeping, and he, he came into the, the room. But you have to go through the room I'm in to go to his room. And um, I think... It, it woke me up because I felt like a presence in the room or I heard the door open or whatever it was. But anyway, and it, I, it woke me up and I, I got a little, I, I was kind of hesitant. I didn't know what to say and I was going to ask him, was he okay, you know, because I felt like a presence in, in the room with me. And when I was just about to ask him, was he okay, he got in the bed and, and lay down. So um, he lays down in the bed, and, and now I'm really feeling uncomfortable at this point because my dad just laid in the bed with me. And he um, began to, like, braise against my breast and, and stuff like that. And um, I just, like remembering trying to shield my my body and you know my private parts and stuff like that and um it seemed like it went on forever but um i think he actually was there for a couple of seconds or minutes i don't even know but he you know laid in the bed for a while and then he ended up getting up and leaving out of the room so the the next day i shared with um with my boyfriend what had went on the, the that night and he had said something to you know his girlfriend about it so I believe she said something to him so when my dad came home from work or whatever you know he said he he was he, he apologized I'm sorry for what happened earlier today it won't happen again I promise okay you really a beautiful young I do apologize. I was always like a daddy's little girl. So, um, I believed him. I thought, you know, clearly it was just an accident. You know, maybe he thought he was in the, in the right room or whatever. So I didn't think, you know, anything else of it. I, I gave him that. I accepted his apology. But then shortly later, it happened again. And um, he had got came in the room again and laid in the bed. 
and um, this time I had the um, covers or something wrapped around me, you know, trying, you know, to just make sure no, none of my body was exposed. And he was trying to pull the cover from from me or whatever. So we was like, you know, he trying to pull and I'm holding on as tight as I can so he can't really get the cover from me. Um, then I remember a, a, a incident where um, he got in the bed and put his leg around me or something so I would be I, I couldn't really move or whatever but anyway I remember three different incidents that have occurred you know that was unpleasant um, but I was able to break away from him this the, the third time and and um, I remember breaking away and running through the door and going inside the bathroom and I was crying you know, and I was upset and I was crying and stuff. And I remember his girlfriend waking up, going to the bathroom and seeing me in the bathroom. And she was like, well, what's wrong? And I, and I, and I told her, like, indicated that it, you know, it had, it happened again. So he ended up getting up and waking up. So now the whole house is woke. Well, him, her, me is up. And, um, him and her actually got into a, a argument and an altercation. I, I remember and why we all in the bathroom and um after that i was just like um you know uh, enough is not enough but before that happened it uh, the second time i believe this incident happened with my dad um i had i was i got upset and i was crying i said you know what this is this is it so i ended up taking some pills that was in the house and Tylenol. I remember taking Tylenol, a handful of Tylenol, and consuming the Tylenol. And my um, my boyfriend came by. And I oh, damn, girl! Took you someone answer the door. Hey, what's going on with you? What happened again? My father. What did your father do? Tell me. He tried to touch me. Oh, shit. What else happened? I know something else happened. Some pills. Wanda, I told you about them damn pills. Why are you so stupid? And he also told the girlfriend what I had done. And I had to... They gave me some milk to make sure to try to get me to, to vomit. In this case, you gotta drink some milk or something. Whatever you got going on inside you, we gotta get it out. And this milk is the only way I know how. Throw this up, you drink this whole glass. Here. Come on now, come on now. Hey, don't spit that out. Hey, finish it, finish it. I don't know what you got going on in here, but I ain't gonna have you all fucked up and sick over here, alright? Stop spitting that out. Damn, girl. Why are you being so stupid? Listen. I'm sorry, alright? I just love you, and I don't want nothing to happen to you. You know I love you, right? You know I care about you. You know I do anything for you. That third time I had got out of here, I, I didn't stay at the, the home anymore because I didn't feel safe. And then not only that, um, I ended up moving where I slept. I wouldn't sleep in that bedroom anymore. I would sleep in the front area, um, I remember. And um, and I was just afraid, you know. I really slept really light because I didn't know when he was gonna come and try something or something would happen or whatever. So I was kind of afraid to even sleep at night. And um, at that point, I knew that it was time for me to, to go back home where I belong. And, um, and that's what I did. And I went back home to, um, to my grandmother. And then I had, you know, just let them know what had happened. My parents, I, I would say, I think they did the best they can is trying to raise their they children. But um, they just had some things going on with them that needed needed some special attention my dad was a, a hustler pretty much all his life and um and indulged in drugs um as well 
and my mom um, I guess had took a liking to drugs um, a drug, drug of choice and became addicted to it so um, at that time I at the young time I didn't know what the arguments were about you know I didn't find out until I became a grown woman that a lot of arguments was because things were missing you know um, nice things would be in the home I remember my mom always getting nice things and having nice things and um, things would turn up missing in the house so it was either being sold or pawned or whatever but things were, would disappear so, um, when it came down to how you felt about your boyfriend after him being there, you know, through the whole Tylenol situation and all that, how did you feel or how did you feel like you feel? You felt? Um, with that present time, and, and it's funny because I had to, um, I think I ended up telling my mom this because they couldn't stand him. They really couldn't stand him. And I had remember calling him and telling my mom that, you know, you should be thankful for him because, you know, he saved your child life, you know. And um, and I thank him, you know, for that, you know, being there and that. Come up, like you just found today. Yeah. All right. I mean, I definitely expect this. We still in school, and a job, but I don't know. We'll figure something out. Uh, at the time that I found out I was pregnant, I was we was just removed from my grandmother's household. Um. My grandmother was, was, was ill and she had us for several years and it got to the point where she just couldn't take care of us anymore. You know, um, my sisters was always getting in trouble in school, they was fighting a lot and I guess it became, it became hard on her. So um, social services had came into the, the picture of New York um, and removed us from the household. So. Yes, ma'am, I am. Yes, well, I've been sent from the Department of Social Services to let you know mm -hmm. that we have received a call because of the children. They have been not been getting proper services inside of the school. They haven't been doing their work. They've been getting in trouble. So we feel like it's because of some of your health conditions. And we would like to remove the children at this time. Lord have mercy. I, I don't sure did the sorry. best I could we for those know, children. We know. We're so yeah. sorry. But in t things like this, we have to do what's best for the children. Uh, they, they my grandchildren. Uh, I don't do the best I possibly could for the no children. Problem, Miss Garrett. My time in med school, I just done the best that I can for my grandchildren. We got to let go now. Children, I'm going to miss all of y'all. I love you. I love you so much. And you know Grandma don't did all she could do for you. I'm really gonna miss y'all, but don't forget about your grandma. Come on, Chief, let's make a Grandma gonna miss you. 
who called, but I know that, you know, it was family influence that helped my grandma, you know, I guess kind of decide and give her the number or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Is your relationship with your grandma close? Or? Yes, my, my grandma is like my mom and my father. She raised me <laughs> from, from a baby. So how did she feel about being behind Um... I think at the time she really didn't want to, but I guess her back was against the wall. You know, you got, she done took care of her kids. Some um, kids is grown. And then she's starting all over with her grandkids, you know, and three different personalities. And like I said, it was not, it was not easy because them teachers would call, my, my sisters would be in trouble and they would be fighting and then fighting amongst each other at home. So I guess it was just, a, it, it was a lie. Do you remember anything that happened throughout the course of the day? Did, it, did anything lead up to the social worker coming? Did anything happen afterwards? Um, all I know is, is that she came and I was home at the time and she was like that we had, you know, we had to be removed. You know, because my grandma wouldn't be our, we wouldn't be in her care anymore. Oh my God, my grandbabies. <laughs> my girls, my grandbaby, my children. I thought he had his moments and I thought, I thought we loved each other. Yeah, young, being young and naive, I, I thought that we loved each other. Um but I, I quickly realized as we got older what love really entailed. Shaquana, I thought I told you not to call this hour, but it's still nice to hear from you, but you up to. Okay, so you said you're going to give me the information. Okay, I will appreciate that. <laughs> really? Okay, I'm going to do that tomorrow night then. Wear a dress for me. The one that accentuates every little curve on you. Yeah, I kind of understand. I mean, we both was being lied to and stuff, so I mean, I can't even fault you too much. But my thing was is that you you knew what was going on. You knew that we had got married, and you know you just kept on pursuing and pushing, and um, that's what was really making me angry. That's why I wanted to see you. Sounds like a good idea to me. Alright. Alright, I'll talk to you later. Bye. When I go to your inbox, that's how I can find all the, um, all your conversations. Okay. I appreciate that. And then, and then you said the night, um, a week after our wedding, he came to your house. Okay. I can't wait until he get in. See what he got to say. Hey, you doing alright? I'm I'm good. You don't you don't need to do all that. Okay, I was wrong? just I was just talking to your little fling things, your ex-girlfriend. 
Okay. My ex. You mean yeah. my ex that I'm friends with? No, it's not that you're friends with. Y'all was being more than friends, you know. Yes, after I after told you, I we just with got it. we just got married, and come to find out, you was at her house a week. After we got we were married. discussing business. We worked together. Let me tell you that. Yeah, we worked together. She does at the not company. work. She does here. So what Listen. company does she work at? She don't work at no no place. So why are you lying? And then furthermore, Listen, you know, you know, this is funny. This no, sounds it's about not crazy. Funny. It's, funny. it's not funny. Then furthermore, and furthermore it is this? a whole bunch of um, okay, you're, you're on Facebook too? Yeah, Facebook. Since when you a get whole on bunch Facebook? Of dialogue of you and other chicks. Like, you just so disgusting. Let me see this. This yeah, some, look some, at this it. some Marty Show you. shit right here. Because it's you. Because, it's no, you. This, this ain't me. I, I don't know who this. You's a liar. I don't you know, know who this saying? is. You must have hacked into somebody else's profile. No. It must have my cousin's No, or first of all, you gave me your password. You forgot? You forgot you gave me your password after you thought you cleaned it up? That's the only reason why you gave me the password? Listen, I've been clean this whole time, a whole year. No, oh. it ain't no whole time. We just Listen, got married. You, you, we, were, we haven't even this, been married three months. This is funny months. right now. This is funny. But we have not been married three months. You are a cheater. You has to go. No I have more. To go. You have to go. What you mean I got to go? Marriage I paid for this over. house. What you mean I you got to go? for nothing. Me and my I business pay for, pay for this house. You, you pay? don't pay for that. You need to get your stuff. Well, I stayed for over a decade. <laughs> I stayed for over a decade. We had a long-term relationship. Um, we end up having a child um, after five years being together, pretty much, and um, we just remain together from from young all the way up into adulthood. And we end up having three kids in common after the the first baby was born, five years, and then seven years later, I believe, no, nine years later, sorry, um, our son was born. And then when we were together for 11 years, the third child was born. But look at this shit. I'm sick of this shit. You see what I'm saying? I'm tired of this shit. You got to go. You got to go Listen, right I don't know who this you is. You got to go. You know what? Come on, I'm going to give you a night to cool. You got to go. I'm going to help your ass today. Uh, no, you need to go. Oh, shit. Hold on. You need to go before I be in jail. You got to go. I'm tired of you cheating. Listen, you a I'm damn liar. You just a dirty, you just dirty. You oh, gotta so go. You, so you hurry, up, hurry up, hurry so up. The rest of the stuff is going in trash. Go, bye, hurry the up. Trash. What you mean the yeah, trash? Yeah, go back to your ex-girlfriend. I'm sure she waiting for you with open arms. You gotta go, bye. Seriously. You need to run. I put that down, okay? Okay. You need to go. Um, in the midst of my pain, I had found unexpected love. Um, going through the process of all the hardship, heartbreak, um, overdose, just wanting to just disappear from this world. I had found um, an unforeseen love and God has allowed me to be able to heal and process through um, the person, my new, um, my new husband, uh, who has helped me go through the process of the divorce and, and healing. Um, his comfort was turning my my um, my tears into joy and, and turning my frowns into smiles. So um, there is a in, in the midst of your pain, there is there is a purpose in in every situation. Life it can leave you so bitter, 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 bitter. You must believe that it gets better. It's better, better, better. 
It's all right. Dry your eyes. Send a prayer to the sky. I know it's hard to fight. But you must believe that it gets better. Almost out of here. I was almost done. I wanted to die. From how I was done wrong. I cried out every night. Looking for a helping hand. That's when it happened. Jesus took me and he held me close. Gave me love. Refilled my heart. Made it grow better because his love is available. He's available anytime. Try him out. Change your life because I know life it can be. You so bitter, 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 bitter. You must believe that it gets better, better, better. Life it can leave you so bitter. Bitter, bitter, bitter. You must believe that it gets better.